So this uh, paper intends to be a description, not a prescription, description of liberation theology. And it's, it doesn't uh, pretend to be exhaustive. Because no theology operates within a vacuum, this paper first tweets a theme of liberation in the Philippine context from other fields. Okay, so uh, the first part is a theme of liberation outside of theology. It's just like Latin American liberation theology. Liberation theology in Latin America wasn't just works of uh, Gutierrez or Boff. We also should include Paulo Freire, for instance, in the field of philosophy of education, and even Europeans like Teilhard de Chardin, okay, uh, and in the overall anti-colonial struggle. So the first field of knowledge is historiography. Philippine historiography, from the time of American colonization, was perceived to be read from the colonizer's perspective. Okay, the uh, narrative then was that the United States came as benevolent patrons. So two Filipino historians questioned this neo-colonial education and became leaders in debunking this narrative. Their project was different from some scholarly enterprises done by intellectuals who focused mainly on the pride of the nation's cultural past. Instead, their works were consciously anti-imperialist. The first is Teodoro Agoncillo. He reacted against a Western denigration of our nationalism as lacking in objectivity and thus a mere emotional outlet for Filipino or Asian bitterness. For him, emotion cannot be divorced from nationalism since our response to and defense against imperialism cannot be reduced to a pure idea. More than any other historian during his era, Agoncillo brought to national consciousness an image of Andres Bonifacio as a great plebeian, a representative of the Massa. Okay. And uh, in the context of the then ongoing hook unrest, this image of Bonifacio did have a powerful iconic significance. The other is Renato Constantino. In one classic essay, he laments over the miseducation of the Filipino by the colonial mindset of Philippine education. He observes, quote, By training, Filipino historians were captives of Spanish and American historiography, both of which inevitably viewed Philippine history through the prism of their own prejudices. He unapologetically admits that a liberating scholarship necessitates a rejection of the paradigm of objectivity and instead sees history from the prism of the struggle of the Filipino massa. He views the events of the 19, rather 1896 revolution as a co-optation of a mass movement by the elite. Then the above two historians would later be followed by many others who may have started their graduate education in the 1960s and 70s which were the times of national turmoil. These historians would disagree on some crucial issues, but they are grouped together since they all claim to be looking at history from the perspective of the struggle of the ordinary Filipino. One is Rinaldo Ileto. He would bring, whereas many would study the Philippine Revolution using standard sources like the writings of the propagandists, Eleto goes against this accepted method and instead studies devotional texts like the Passion. He relates this manifestation of folk Christianity for the, or to the formation of the idea of Kalayaan and eventually the development of a revolutionary consciousness among the natives. Even though, again, they may employ different methods, there are other historians would also focus not on the centers of power, but on the peripheries. Not on people belonging to the establishment, but on the marginalized. An example is a study of uh, a commu the community of Zamora Ilocos by Raul Pertiera. 
Now another classic, by the way, he would use sociological theories of Marx, Weber, and Durkheim and explores how this small community has appropriated religious messages from Catholicism, Protestantism, and other separatist denominations. Another classic in how Indus appropriated religion and colonization is Vincent Raphael. In his book, Contracting Colonialism, which actually can be a study of what can be called the politics of translations in Christian evangelization. Raphael contends that in Hispanizing the Tagalog language, words like Dios and Virgen were never given the Tagalog equivalents. The early Christian missionaries were conveying a hierarchy of languages as a means to communicate to the divine. But, Raphael adds, when the Indians translated the Castilian language to the native tongue, they also had their own way of resisting the intentions of the missionaries, and the result was not always what the missionaries intended. Another historian, Benedict Anderson, uh, is immersed in Philippine life, and his uh, specialization in Southeast Asian studies has helped frame the nationalist discourse in the Philippines. Although he is much more known for his classic, Imagined Communities, his study on the Kasiki culture is a major contribution to sociological discourse here in the Philippines. In one essay in the book, A Specter of Comparisons, he writes that Filipino politics is so spectacularly different from those of any other country in Southeast Asia. And what makes it different? It is the widespread phenomenon of Kasiki democracy which allows elite political dynasties to rule the country. Politics becomes a rivalry between two Kasiki families. The term Kasiki seems to be loosely defined but can generally refer to the elites or the oligarchs who rule whether in the local or national levels. Another historian who has contributed to the sociological discourse in the Philippines is Alfred McCoy. The volume, Lives at the Margin, which he edited, contains different accounts of ordinary Filipinos. This would include a labor leader, a millenarian who became a presidential candidate, a Shenda worker, hard, a Shenda worker who became a leader of the New People's Army, and so on and so forth. I think his most anti-imperialist writing seems to be policing America's empire. In this work, McCoy demonstrates that surveillance methods employed by the United States on its opponents worldwide were first employed on Filipinos in the process of colonizing the Philippines. Another a book which cannot be excluded in our survey is John Schumacher's Revolutionary Clergy. The relevance of this book cannot be underestimated, especially in the context of the discussion of the role of the ordained clergy during the martial law period. This book shows that the clergy's participation in revolutionary struggles has some precedence in our history. In this book, Schumacher documents, documented what some clerics did during the revolution against Spain and the war against America. Some Filipino clergy took up arms, and many were at least sympathetic to the nationalist cause. But the heroes of Schumacher are actually those who, like Mariano Gomez, fought for the principles of nationalism and worked for the reforms of the clergy, but ultimately remained loyal to the church. Gomez was a disciple of the martyred Jose Burgos, described by Schumacher as a priest and nationalist. Our brief survey should also include a scholar of Mindanao history who has indeed questioned the nationalist narrative in understanding the struggles of the Muslims. Patricio Abinales believes that the nationalist perspective is inadequate and overly simplistic since many Muslims did not consider themselves as part of the national polity during the Spanish regime and even up to the beginnings of the American occupation. Another, another field, cultural anthropology. Attempts to question prevailing mindsets is not limited to historiography. In the field of cultural anthropology, Carl Gaspar, 
who is here present. Some of the authors I will be mentioning are here present. Carl Gaspar has fought for the rights of the Lumads, or indigenous people, to self-determination, not only in his written works, but also in his praxis. These rights are concretized in the recognition of their ancestral domain, their ability to live peacefully, and the development of their li livelihood, and the avail availability of education. Whereas many classical cultural anthropologists would be primarily interested in a phenomenological description of particular group's culture, which is oftentimes perceived from a privileged and dominating perspective, Gaspar commits his scholarship to the struggle of the Lumad, one group of marginalized indigenous people whose voices he wants to be heard in public discourse is the Manubus of the Arakan Valley. He appropriates a Burmese's theory of communicative action, which presupposes an argumentation which excludes all force, quote, excludes all force except the force of the better argument. Gaspar also enters into the theme of liberating force of the masses in his book, Masses Are Misaya, which I can interpret as a uh, concretization of Kucheres' book, The Power of the Poor in History. A redemptorist brother by vocation and a cultural anthropologist by professional training, Gaspar answers questions of his commitment to the Lumad by citing, among others, no, the Christian themes of caring for the least of our brothers and sisters. Now we go to uh, literary criticism. The same hermeneutical methods employed by liberation theologians in interpreting the sacred texts of their religious traditions are used by San Juan in the field of literary criticism. Thus, a classic like for Florante at Laura is not just a romantic story. Rather, together with Rizal's writing, it, it constitutes the inaugural discourse of our maturing, irresistibly ripening national democratic culture. San Juan highlights, for instance, the character of a Moor, a symbol of Spain, Christianity's enemy, who rescues Florante. This, for San Juan, is a prefiguration of the, quote, enlightenment dream of a transnational, anti-sectarian world community. How's this? Okay. Anyway, okay. No, not yet. Uh, oh, yeah. The theme of liberation is present in the world of fiction as well, which we can divide into two, films and novels. By the way, in my put note, I said, plays were actually very effective in the, off, in the efforts at raising the consciousness of people, not just novels and films. But uh, I, mean, I have not come across examples of this plays. So. so the theme of liberation is present in the world of fiction as well. Among the films... With the theme of liberation during the time of Marcus huh, is Ben Cervantes' Sacada, which is the story of the oppression of sugar plantation workers in the province of Negros Occidental. Another is Sister Stella L., which is about a nun's participation in the struggle of factory workers. We can mention two films among many of Lino Broca with a liberationist theme, Manila sa mga kukunang liwanag, which is about the struggles of people from the provinces in the impersonal and impressive life in the nation's capital. The other is Kapit Sapatalim, a story of an underpaid and overworked laborer who was driven to crime. And numerous novels came out which also questioned the hegemonic interpretation of the martial law period or the historical revisionism that followed it. One is Bamboo in the Wind by Oranza, which is a narrative of families and friends who face the dilemmas between pragmatism and survival on the one hand and moral principles and persecution by the state on the other hand. Ninochka Roska's Twice Blessed is a satire on the Marcus, Marcus's couple, the Marcus couple, the political elite, and the whole martial law regime in general. We can mention in passing some other fields, like in philosophy, Rocky Ferriols has advocated for the use of Filipino in philosophizing, and to some extent also uh, Emerita Quito of De La Salle University. In economics, Alejandro Lechalco was a foremost advocate of national industrialization and a critique on uh, the overdependence of, or a critique against overdependence of the United States. 
Now we go to Filipino liberation theology. So uh, this other, the theme of liberation outside theology is just uh, the uh, the uh, context. No? In this paper, we give a more inclusive description of liberation theology as a fa- as all faith inspired struggles against ideas or structures that are perceived to be enslaving. Thus, to the extent that people power revolutions were inspired by religious faith, then they are included in the definition. Apparently, this would go against the view that since these revolutions were not sufficiently accompanied by social analysis and were just for change in leadership, then they could not be classified as liberating. First, on the level of praxis, faith-inspired struggles against then Marcos dictatorship is well docu- documented. The struggles can be performed by those outside the social boundaries of the church or the ecclesial community. It's available in uh, the bookstores there. Uh, this book, uh, Fired from Within, published by uh, the uh, Carmelites or Institute of uh, Spirituality in Asia. Now, we, you, the hierarchy then during martial law would be very suspicious of those in the underground as uh, lacking in, lacking in uh, faith in God. But this book would, would uh, demonstrate that they were also inspired by their faith to go to uh, the hills. And sometimes it could also be within the church. Liberating practice would include the formation of basic ecclesial communities, the, conscientiza- the, the conscientization of people that went with it. Okay. Now, on the level of academic liberation theology, it is customary to divide theologians into conservatives, moderates, and radicals. At the risk of oversimplification, the conservatives follow the view that the sacred and the profane are totally separate, and thus a church must not involve itself in the world. The moderates were in favor of critical collaboration with the government. They were calling for greater freedom and respect for human rights. However, they were not deep into social analysis. And uh, they were, they, they were uh, not deep into social analysis, most especially if this would invoke Marxist categories. Moder- moderates are also not keen to, were also not keen to approve of armed struggle. Now, the, uh, what the moderates lack may be the distinguishing element of uh, the radicals. They go into analysis of societal and political structures and the structures that contribute to or cause the ongoing repression. So, uh, in this brief paper, we consider only the moderates and the radicals. So first, Arevalo and uh, Lambino, they would say that... Uh, the church must involve it herself in liberation, but they would caution that uh, liberation must not be exclusively intra-historical. And then, uh, he is here present also, Jose de Meza criticized the 1984 document from the Congregation of the Doctrine of Faith as neo-scholastic in its methodology. He laments the neglect of the role of human experience in the Vatican document. Indeed, this lay theologian has emphasized that Christian theology always involves two poles. First, that of human experience, and second, the Judeo-Christian tradition. This is in reaction against neo-scholastic methodology of theologizing where there is a one-way traffic from the presentation of church teachings to the applications of these teachings to concrete situations. He would follow the same um, methodology in his books on Christology and ecclesiology, and uh, l- lately he has been working on retrieving Filipino values and concepts in his uh, theological enterprise. Another theologian, be the late Carlos Abesames, he would argue that if we follow the intentions of our Lord Jesus, the reign of God is to be understood in this worldly sense of a new earth. Thus, our aim is not simply to go to heaven, but to contribute to the construction of the kingdom. Okay. Another biblical exegete, by the way, is Sister Helen Graham, who deliberately takes a liber- liberationist approach while engaging in the historical critical method. Lastly, among the theologians would be, um, of course there are many, but in my paper this, he would be the last, 
Edicio de la Torre, who founded a group called Christians for National Liberation. He argues that the Church should concern herself not just with social problems, plural, but with the social problem. The former can be likened to different diseases afflicting a person. The latter, social problem, singular, is the root cause that makes a person vulnerable to various diseases. Related to this distinction is another distinction between social action and social reform. Social action addresses the problems, but social reform should address the problem of the unequal distribution of wealth and of power in the Philippines. Now, we go now to the last section, liberation theology in a post-authoritarian context. Okay, so... uh, Just like in Latin America, the origins of liberation theology in the Philippines is a struggle from political dictatorship, which was supported by the United States and the economic oppression that went with it. The institutional church and the people contributed much to end the repressive Marcos regime. But once the authoritarian context gave way to a democratic space, liberation theology also needed to take some new forms in new advocacies. It did not advocate the return to the sacristy, but continued to engage in discourses related to politics. One advocacy is the environment. The CBCP issued a pastoral letter in 1988 entitled, What is Happening to Our Beautiful Land?, which contains lamentation over the extent of environmental degradation in the Philippines. And uh, in in local churches, this has been uh, concretized in uh, anti-lagging uh, programs. For instance, Nerlito Satur, a priest from the Diocese of Malay Balay, was martyred when he led the opposition to the logging activities. Academic theology has also belatedly entered into this discourse in the environment, appropriating Leonardo Boss' works on ecology. Ray Raluto looks on looks at, rather, the ideological mechanisms that foster poverty and environmental degradation. Raluto shows that poverty and the crisis in ecology are two sides of the same coin. So that's one environment. And then the other, uh, gender equality. In this advocacy, one pioneer among the religious is Sister Mary John Manansan. One of the points he raises is that in schools and in homes, The patriarchal notion on what is prim and proper is imposed upon the female population. Thus, females are not taught to assert their rights. Another Filipina feminist theologian is Agnes Bezal. Her interests are varied. Feminism, post-colonial discourse, theology and cyberspace, intercultural discourse, and the theology of migration. But we choose the issue, last year, of migration and the rights of migrants as as the last topic to consider with Agnes Brazal as the leading advocate. She appropriates the Trinitarian notion of the radical equality of the three persons to argue for, quote, relationality and mutuality, equality and diversity, creativity and fecundity. She asserts that while there are particularities and discontinuities among different cultures, intercultural dialogue must continue. In this dialogue, it is not enough to provide opportunities for interaction. The asymmetrical power relations need to be acknowledged. Now, to conclude, discourses on liberation are shaped by specific historical context. The context of liberation theology today is different from the context into which it originally emerged. And so there has to be a continuing discernment and discourse on what we need to be liberated from. Thank you.